Thank you, um, and thank you to the organizers, Dr. Kamini, for uh, inviting me to Bangalore, a wonderful city, and I'm having a great time, so thank you for that. And I grew some more hair since the photograph, so uh, it's the same guy. Anyway, I'm going to talk to you about the origins of health and disease and the contributions of mum and dad. Um, the outline of the talk, I'll talk about the origins of health and disease, uh, genetics and gender, and then parental choices and how we can influence them. So how do we define health and disease? Who in the World Health Organization in 1948 defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity? That's a very old definition. It's um, stood the test of time, but we are arguing the toss on the term complete because are we all completely healthy all of the time? So they may be redefining that in the near future. And they define disease as a particular abnormal condition, a disorder, or a structure of function that affects part or all of the organism. So there are many multicultural, uh, multifactorial conditions that cause health and disease. Um, there are genetics, but there are other things. We need to add in the environment, the lifestyle, etc. It's a uh, many factors determine health and disease. So we can look at the socio-economics, we can look at the physical environment, and those of you that saw the news yesterday about Delhi and the fact that people are getting these HEPA filters, not just in their labs, but in their homes as well, to combat the pollution. But I'm gonna concentrate on the individual characteristics. So I'm gonna look at the genetics, the gender, and the parental behavior. So let's look at the genetics and gender. We know, I'm sure, that the mom brings in 23 chromosomes, the dad brings in 23 chromosomes, we end up as individuals with 46 chromosomes. What happens when it goes wrong, when the number changes? We have aneuploidies, okay? And these are some common aneuploidies. So we have trisomies, uh, 16, 21 causes Downs, 18 causes Edwards, and 13 causes Patel syndrome. Then we have the sex chromosome trisomies, we have triple X, we have Kleinfelters, which we heard about yesterday, and we also have 47 XYY. We have the monosomies, such as Turner's, um, Cry de Chat, and we also have tetrasomies and pentasomies. So we have many uh, conditions where aneuploidy occurs. Most aneuploidies occur in uogenesis, in meiosis 1 rather than meiosis 2, and the chance of aneuploidy, as we heard in the last talk, increases with age. I'm sure you've seen these sorts of figures. Um, they have a graph on the left that shows the increase of trisomies with age, and the graph on the right just shows the increase of aneuploidies with maternal age. Here is a, a good paper by Terry Hassold called The Origin of Human Aneuploidy, Where We Have Been, Where Are We Going? It's free to download, and this just goes to show that most of the aneuploidies occur in meiosis one. Because if you think about it, the oocytes are laid down when you're six weeks old as a female, and then they stay at the prophase one stage until the time of ovulation. So in a way, there's no, no doubt as to why aneuploidies occur, especially as you get older. They can't keep these chromosomes in the impact condition that they should be at. So aneuploidy is astonishingly common. 5% of all clinical pregnancies are trisomic or monosomic. Uh, most terminate in utero, and aneuploidy is the leading known cause of miscarriage. Um, some trisomies, such as Downs, are compatible with life. Um, but the aneuploidies are the leading causes of congenital health defects and uh, mental retardation. So the first advice I'm going to give mom and dad is, while some aneuploidies are age independent, do consider your age. Start reproducing in your 20s if you can. And, and we, we heard yesterday about freezing eggs because you can't find the right guy. Well, do freeze those eggs. What about inherited diseases uh, from mom and dad? Um, well, we have the autosomal dominance. Um, so if one parent has an autosomal dominant, such as Huntington's, then you have a 50-50 chance of getting the disease. And you can see here that the, uh, the male has the affected gene um, and the female doesn't, and yet in the next generation, 50% chance of having the affected gene. What about the X-linked recessive diseases? Well, hemophilia is an example. Hemophilia is carried on the X chromosome. If mom has hemophilia, then the sons are at a higher risk of getting it because they only have one X chromosome. If you have a daughter, she dilutes it, so she has less chance of getting hemophilia. What about gender? Should mom and dad select for gender? Sex selection. It's acceptable for some medical reasons, of course, but should we select um, 
is for, for social reasons. That's unacceptable in many countries. Um, you could argue for family balancing if you have five daughters. Could I have a son? If you have five sons, could I have a daughter? That is more debatable. Um, the methods for sex selection include sperm sorting, not 100%, PGD, that is 100%, and NIPT, as we heard about in the last talk. But with NIPT, should you then consider abortion if you don't want the sex of that child? And I was glad to see yesterday when I visited a clinic that certainly over here, um, prenatal sex determination is not done in the clinics. It's a punishable act, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So sex-specific diseases from dad. Well, really with dad, we need to look at, I'll call it an Y-linked disease. And a Y-linked disease, I'm going to call that male infertility. Now, we need to think about ICSI here. ICSI, as you know, came about in 1992 by Palermo. He published the first study from the, Brus the Brussels group in Belgium. Um, and there was concern that if we are, have guys with male infertility, are we creating sons that are going to have male infertility? Now the sons are adults from that first group. And they've done tests on those sons, and indeed there is male infertility. However, it's a weak negative correlation. They only looked at 54 people, but it does seem that, in fact, we are providing another generation of male infertility. So that's something to consider as well. Should we blame dad for that? I don't know. Should we consider donor gametes then? If, if mum can't bring good gametes to the party and dad can't bring good gametes to the party, should we look to donor gametes? Donor banks often provide fertile donors, so we know that they can provide healthy babies. But the genetic screen on those donors is always going to be limited. I'll give you some examples of egg donations to begin with. In 2008, from the US, a lady called Jessica Wing, an ideal egg donor. Tall, slender, attractive. She was a model as a teenager. She went on and got a degree from uh, Stanford, a great university. Your perfect donor. Would you pay to have those eggs? Well, uh, certainly the bank paid her a lot of money for her eggs. She donated three times at the age of 22. Seven years later, she was found to have colon cancer, age 29. She died two years later. She had a rare genetic disease. That bank then had to go to the babies that were born and the parents and say, sorry, uh, the eggs we gave you weren't genetically perfect at all. And that's why, if you look on any donor bank, egg donor bank on the internet, you'll find that they're doing more and more screening these days. This was just one example that I picked out before for the talk. What about the guys, sperm donors? Well, they're not so perfect either, unfortunately. Um, here's a, a study, or a, study, a publication from the, our tabloid in the UK, the, the Daily Mail. 2009, we had a sperm bank where there was a genetic flaw in one of the donors. They had to go to the couples again and the offspring to say, sorry, the sperm we provided had a genetic flaw. Two years later, a similar thing, sorry, sperm donor, tw sperm donors, 24 kids, never told about his fatal genetic illness. So again, the donor sperm is never going to be 100% because you can't screen for everything. Um, you can look on the internet, I just did a Google search and I found these things. Uh, this was blogsbabycenter.com, um, a Danish sperm bank. Um, at least nine donor offspring internationally sold this sperm to the US, to Sweden, to Belgium. Um, the donor was allowed to conceive 25 children, and then you find out afterwards the donor has a rare genetic disease, in this case, neurofibromatosis type 1. It's not something you screen for as a standard, but unfortunately, again, you have to go back to the couples and say, sorry, we didn't provide you with perfect sperm. And this is a, a typical bank now that does list the genetic screens that it does do for sperm donors, but it's not 100%. What about mitochondrial disease? This is a relatively new thing that we're looking at, certainly in the UK. Mitochondrial disease, prevalence, one in 10,000 people are affected, um, one in 250 born with a potentially uh, pathogenic mito mitochondrial DNA mutation. And 15% of these are caused by mitochondrial DNA mutations, either de novo or maternally inherited. They cause a range of diseases. They can be debilitating. They can be fatal. They can come on at a later onset in life. The paper I will refer you to is by Louise Dunlop from Newcastle. Uh, she publishes quite a lot in Nature because it is such novel, groundbreaking work that they're doing up in Newcastle about uh, how to cure mitochondrial disease. So, just to give you a bit more on inheritance, the egg brings about 200,000 mitochondria to the party. 
The sperm brings about 75 mitochondria to the party. When you are a fertilized egg, all of the sperm mitochondria is knocked out. You always inherit the female mitochondria. So how do we go about looking to see if you're going to um, inherit mitochondrial DNA mutations? Well, you can do PGD, so you can select embryos with a lower mutation load, and the mutation load is set at 18% as the threshold. I don't know where they got that figure from, but 18% is what's accepted. But then, um, are we selecting the correct blasphemies when we do this? We just heard about mosaicism. And I'll just give you a quick rundown on mosaicism again. If you're euploid, then all your cells will be euploid, that's fine. If you're 100% aneuploid, all your cells will be aneuploid. But if you're a mixture, if you're doing PGD on that embryo on the bottom there, if you pick the wrong cell, you might say, oh, I've got a euploid cell, or no, I've got an aneuploid cell. And similarly, with the mutated mitochondria, you might have it in one cell but not the other. So is this really the best way of doing testing for mitochondrial mutations? Um, there are other ways, and this is where the UK is leading the field at the moment. If you look at this slide, what they do is they have the eggs with the mutated mitochondria, they're the bottom layer, and then you have the donor oocytes with the good mitochondria in the top layer. And you can take out the mitochondrial spindle from the mutated egg, and you can reconstitute that into the good egg, where they have the good mitochondria, then you can go on and fertilize that, thus getting rid of the mitochondrial um, mutations in the offspring. And this is what it looks like. You need um, a special type of microscope so as you can see the mitochondrial spindle to take it out. I've done this, it's, it's quite a nifty procedure to do, um, but that's what it looks like under the polarized microscope. Another way of doing it is to take out the pronuclear, see, pronucleuses. So you um, fertilize the egg even though it's got the mutated mitochondria. Then when you have the 2PN stage, as soon as you get the two pronuclei, you take them out and then you reconstitute them into a donor oocyte with good mitochondria. And then that you go on, you get the embryo and you implant that and you'll have a healthy baby. And this is a, a picture of how they take out the pronuclei. You need a bigger pipette, so I would be more cautious of this method because you might get a carryover of the mutated mitochondria because of the size of the pipette that you're using. Um, now, we have the HFEA in the UK. I'm sure you've all heard of it. It's our, um, our government regulator. They've actually allowed us to do this in the UK. We're the first country doing this, so it's quite novel for us. Um, and there was quite a lot of debate, public consultation, etc., about it. But it is the way forward. Now, let's look at parental behavior. This is something that we should have more control over. We can look at preconception, the lifestyle and the gametes that we produce. We can look at periconception around the time that we're having ART treatment, if we're having that. And then we can look at postconception, the lifestyle during duration. So let's look at preconception first of all. When you are coming and you're considering preconception, really you need to look at screening. Uh, screening for rubella, screening for sexually transmitted infections. Because we don't want to be the cause of having diseases in the offspring that we could have got rid of with antibiotics, with treatment. So we would advise everybody to have a screen because we don't want to pass on conjunctivitis due to chlamydia. We don't want to pass on congenital rubella simply because the parents had it. That's not fair. The blood-borne viruses, you can have treatment for that. You can wash off HIV from sperm and then you can, provide, you can cause babies to be born without HIV. Surely we have to do that. So advice to mum and dad, have an STI, or potentially mum and dad, have an STI screen before you do anything. And then there's the standard stuff. Quit smoking, quit the alcohol, quit the recreational drugs, and do consider nutrition and some supplements. What about periconception at the time that they're coming to see us in the IVF clinics? Okay, uh, we have embryo selection methods. We've talked about PGD. We've talked about, well, we haven't talked about it, but we could consider donation. We could consider the number of embryos to transfer and whether we should freeze all of our embryos. PGD, I'll just briefly go over this. Um, we do it for serious genetic conditions if there are um, repeat miscarriages. We do it if you have a serious genetic condition in an existing child already, or if you know that you are gonna inherit a serious genetic condition from your family history. We know PGD helps us to select the best embryo, the healthy embryo for transfer, um, but ideally you need several embryos. 
You can have cases where you have four or five embryos, but I've had those cases, and you do the testing, and they're all, they all carry the disease. So then you have to say, sorry, we can't do a transfer. Ideally, you have about 10 embryos, and then you've got at least a chance of getting an embryo that doesn't have the disease. Uh, before the clinic allows um, you to have PGD in the UK, we have to go to the HFEA, and we have to justify, is the condition serious enough to have PGD? Now, I don't think they've actually turned down a condition yet, but if you go onto Google, go onto the HFEA website, you'll see a list of all the diseases that we've done so far in the UK and treated with PGD, and there are new ones coming up every week. So we've got maple syrup urine disorder, Fried syndrome, glutaric acidemia. These are all new ones that we're now doing PGD for. We do PGD for other diseases, early onset diseases, such as Alzheimer's, we're allowed to do that. Um, BRCA1, uh, spina and bulbar muscular dystrophy, which is an X-linked disease. And then we do PGD for male embryos only, uh, again for the X-linked diseases uh, as well. What about multiple births? Um, a hot topic, um, so I'll talk to you about the UK situation. Um, first of all, we have it ground into us that if we are going to produce multiple births, then that's an iatrogenic condition that we could be creating in the children. We could be causing diseases in the children simply because we wanted to put two embryos back, to put, two, to put three embryos back. I strongly say to you, do consider, and I know it's a big topic over here, but do consider putting back one embryo rather than two embryos and three embryos. Because if you have a good vitrification program, why should you increase the risk of a disease in the child? It's simply not fair. We have a website called oneatatime.org.uk. Please do look at that. Please show your patients that website. It lists the risks that you could be putting that, those children through if you put back more than one embryo. It also looks at the risks that you put the mother through, such as gestational diabetes. Is it fair to do that? So do have a look at this. And we find now, through education of our patients, that more and more of our patients want one embryo back. And even when we have poor quality embryos, we say, consider having two back. They say, no, no, we want one embryo back. So it's all about patient education. And as I say, if you have a good vitrification program, then you should be okay with that. So advice to parents, put one embryo back at a time, but ensure that the clinic has a good vitrification program. Post-conception, well, I'm sure you've all heard of the Barker's hypothesis. David Barker from Southampton, a professor in the UK. He looked in the 80s at birth weight, and he linked birth weight to the adult conditions that came from it, and he found that lower birth weights were linked to adult heart disease. Poor genital nutrition was linked to cardiac and metabolic disorders such as stroke, such as type 2 diabetes, such as high blood pressure. Again, at the time, this was novel work, so it was published in The Lancet, and all of these papers are free to download from the internet. It got to the cover of Time magazine. It was that relevant uh, at the time. Um, some quotes, an environment producing poor fetal growth is followed by an adult environment that determines a high risk for heart disease. Another one, by the time the embryo arrives in the uterus, very important biological decisions have been made and those are unchangeable. So we need to consider what we're doing to our embryos and we need to consider the, the mother's environment as she's carrying that embryo post-implantation. So when you have oocyte recipients, this is a big role for the oocyte recipient. They may not be her eggs, but she can really put a lot of effort into providing a good uterus. She plays a vital role in preparing that uterus for gestation. And would you put the same embryo, if you put them back into different sized women, would you get the same result? This is the way I explain it to patients. You've got some seeds, you can put it into healthy soil, you can put it into poor soil. It's up to you to provide that soil. Healthy soil will give rise to healthy plants, bad soil, no plants. If you do get plants, then they're not going to be too healthy. So it's up to you as the oocyte recipient to provide the best soil you can in your womb. So advice to mum and dad number four, reduce the, to reduce the risk of uh, pregnancy complications, take folic acid or reduce the risk of spina bifida, have a healthy diet, and as usual, avoid the drugs, the alcohol, the smoking. Now, what about you guys who have the IVF clinics, including myself? In the IVF lab, what can go wrong? Many areas, okay? Embryologists need to look at all of the areas in the lab where 
we have an influence on the embryo because all of these can affect the health of the embryo and the health of the offspring. This is why quality control is so important as we discussed this morning. Culture, media and birth weight, that's a big one. Um, there's extensive evidence from animal studies that pregnancy outcome and birth weight is affected by the type of embryo culture media you use. It's also affected by the type of stimulation you use. This paper, a very good review in human reproduction. Does the type of culture media influence birth weight of children born after IVF? This looked at 11 studies and it showed that five studies, and they were the biggest studies with the highest number of embryos in them, showed that yes, embryo culture media does actually influence the birth weight. So this is quite a concern. Should you be using Medicult? Should you be using Vitrolife? I mean, you need to look at these studies. However, they did put a get out clause in this paper. They said that the effect of culture media on growth of IVF offspring is still not definitively elucidated but it might be becoming that way. So do consider your culture media. Another paper from Fertility and Sterility, freezing and birth weight. Should we freeze our embryos, all our embryos, or should we put them back fresh? We know that the stimulation drugs do have a, actually a detrimental effect on the uterus in the stimulated cycle. So should we freeze the embryos and put them back in a cycle where we don't have those drugs affecting the uterus, making the uterus better? There are clinics in the US that are doing this now with higher success rates. Um, so it says better maternal and perinatal outcomes after frozen ET, but possibly large for gestational age babies. But again, is it a higher birth weight baby, which means a healthier baby? Um, so something to consider, but you need a good freezing program for that. What about practical techniques? Embryologists, you can affect the health of the offspring. So this is why you need a quality manager to check that all of your embryologists are performing the techniques to the correct level. When they're doing ICSI, look at the technique. The fast ones, are the fast ones at ICSI really doing as good a results as, as the slower ones? Or are the slower ones taking too long? Um, look at biopsy. If you're biopsying an eight cell embryo, are you taking out one cell for the biopsy or are you taking out two cells? Some labs I go to routinely take out two cells. That's a quarter of the embryo. So when those embryos are implanted, they're gonna be of lower birth weight because you've taken out the foundations of the baby. Um, we spoke yesterday about sperm selection techniques and artificial activation. They're fairly novel. We need to look at the long-term effects on the babies before we absolutely incorporate these techniques into the lab. Doctors, look at the stimulation. What can go wrong with the stimulation? Many things again. So this can all have an effect on the eggs that are produced and that can have an effect on the offspring. So do consider all of the aspects when you're prescribing the protocols for ovarian stimulation. Uh, maternal factors and the risk of birth defects, a paper that just came out last month, so I thought I'd put it in there, from South Australia. They did a retrospective study of the birth register and they looked back to see what were the real factors that were affecting birth defects. And the two, the main ones that they came up with were actually increased maternal age and smoking. So, as usual, same advice, start reproducing early and avoid smoking. So should we blame our parents? Well, we're still learning about the interactions between genes and the environment and how they might determine the baby's future health. We can control some of the areas, but not all of them. So imprinting, well, I haven't even spoken about imprinting. We know that occurs more with IVF than with natural conception. So we need to also consider that perhaps. Some ethical dilemmas to leave you with. This was um, uh, a chap that came to the HFEA. He's deaf and he had a deaf wife. And he saw deafness as a gift, and he wanted to have a deaf child. Um, but the UK wouldn't allow them to have PGD, okay? Were we wrong? Were we right? Ethical decisions. He said, deafness is a rich culture which has its own language, history, and traditions. We have seen more rights for disabled people. Are they now seeking to establish a legal principle that deaf people are inferior? Well, the UK said, no, we're not going to provide you with a deaf child. Ethical dilemma. Another one, we spoke about NIPT in the last talk. With NIPT, we can get rid of all the Down syndrome babies. Um, and there was a very moving documentary on BBC Two just before I came out to see you guys, um, talking about this lady. She's in the Bridget Jones film. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, she's got a Down syndrome uh, son. And they were saying, you know, if we do NIPT and we get rid of all the Downs, is that really the correct thing to be doing? Are we playing eugenics? 
What about the Down syndrome children that are left in the world? Are they unique? Is there something wrong with them, really? So ethical dilemmas. Um, we have also the opportunity for expanded um, preconception carrier screening. We can now do this. Um, we can look at many, many genes. We all ha carry genetic problems of some sort within us. But are we really being selfish by looking at all of these genes when we're not really going to pass them on? So another ethical uh, problem. Um, so preconception beneficence. Above all, do good toward one's potential child. I agree with that. Or are you solely considering the needs of yourselves, you as mum and dad, and how do you then discuss that with your child? There's the Gorgodian knot, um, an impossible knot. The only way to untie that knot is to cut it with a sword. Okay? So this is the sort of thing we can get wrapped up in. So what are the options for mum and dad? Um, use your own gametes and risk what God gives you. Play God a little bit, do PGD, do NIPT. Um, you can get rid of diseases, syndromes and gender that way, or you can select the gender that way. Should you use donor gametes, pass on the problems to someone else, or, or say that to your children, well look, it wasn't my gametes, it was another person's gametes. Or do you even adopt? All considerations. But remember, being a parent means loving your children more than you've ever loved yourself. And I'll leave that thought with you. I'd like to thank Dr. Louise Dunlop for the um, information on mitochondrial mutations, and Dr. Tony Gordon for Genesis Genetics, and of course, you guys. Thank you.